All right, so I am choosing to make a video at 9 p.m. Pacific time. It is currently midnight on the East Coast. By the time I get this video out, it will probably be about midnight on the West Coast. And I'm making a video because, as you all know, CNN just had five back-to-back -back town halls, each one hour long, and this entire event, five hours long in total. So let me just start this video by complaining about how long that is and how it would be a lot better if they broke this up and did one per night because, Jesus Christ, I felt like I just ran a marathon. Like, that is just too many town halls in the same evening. And by the time we passed that midway point, like once we got about halfway into Kamala's, I was already struggling to pay attention. By the time we got to Pete Buttigieg, I had already mentally tuned out and I had to force myself to try to pay attention. Um, so this was just, it was brutal and we need to not do this again. Let's, let's do one per night next time guys, because that was just, that was difficult. And I'll say this, I actually didn't watch all five of them. I missed the most of um, Amy Klobuchar's. I, I tuned in to like the last five minutes. I wasn't necessarily planning on watching hers. I probably will try to catch it later. But um, generally speaking, I don't care about Amy Klobuchar at all. Like, I don't even want to watch it to see if there's anything that I may be able to criticize her for because she's just so boring. But I will say this, um, I tweeted about this and I asked people whether or not she was asked the question about why she, <laughs> why she chose to eat salad with a comb and everybody like kind of responded jokingly, but I was actually being 100% serious. Like I genuinely want more details on this story because I am captivated by this story. Um, so if I were in a town hall and I were able to ask her a question, I would certainly ask her a question about the salad with a comb. And look, you all know me. You saw the interview that I did with Andrew Yang and not to toot my own horn, but toot toot. It was full of substance. But when it comes to Amy Klobuchar, there's something about her that makes me only want to ask her the question about eating salad with a comb. Um, so... <laughs> I will give you kind of this broad overview. I originally wanted to talk about this tomorrow, but I figured it would make more sense to talk about it now since I just watched all of these um, and it's still fresh on my mind. But as you can tell, I'm starting off this video rambling, so we're already off to a poor start. This will probably be like 35 minutes by the time we're over, so you should probably just click out of the video now. But for those of you who are choosing to stay, Let's talk about all of these town halls. So before we start talking about the individual town halls, um, I'm going to stay focused on Klobuchar just for a second because I want to share the Jeb Bush moment because I didn't watch her town hall, but throughout the um, commercial breaks, I was trying to find clips that people were pulling from her town hall event, and she literally had a Jeb Bush moment. Take a look. And every single time I have run, I have won every single congressional district in my state, including Michelle Bachman's. Okay? That's when you guys are supposed to cheer. Okay? Man. That's amazing. So, <laughs> overall, um, I think that all of the candidates were asked pretty difficult questions, with the exception of Elizabeth Warren. I think that even though she was challenged to a degree... I think Kamala Harris and Bernie Sanders were challenged the most, and even Pete Buttigieg had a couple of tough questions, but overall, you cannot deny how unfair these questions were when it comes to Bernie Sanders. He had a number of questions. In fact, virtually every single question that was posed to him forced him to take a defensive stance. There were no softballs, nothing that allowed him to kind of just talk at length about any of his policy proposals. He was forced to defend himself. And there were a number of gotcha questions that irritated me to no end. So CNN is garbage. Like, I think that we need to establish that before going forward. CNN is complete garbage. And it's clear that all they were trying to do was ask questions that would generate headlines. Because if you generate headlines, you may generate more views and clicks and ratings. And that benefits them monetarily. So I absolutely am disgusted with 
with CNN. But with that being said, I'm going to try to put that aside. I'll talk about Bernie's town hall in a separate video since that's the one that matters the most to me. But let's get to Elizabeth Warren. So I have my old fashioned uh, pen and paper. We're going to do it that way. And um, I think she did a really good job overall. With that being said, she kind of had the advantage of not having... Uh, having CNN jump down her throat without having biased questioners, but I think she did a good job explaining her student loan debt cancellation plan. It doesn't go as far as Jill Stein's plan, for example, but it's still phenomenal. She explained that. She explained really well about why we need to break up the big tech. So there were a lot of moments that gave Elizabeth Warren the opportunity to really shine, and I think that she capitalized on that, and she performed exceptionally well. When it comes to impeachment, she talked at length about impeachment, and I think that she lays out a very thorough and detailed reason as to why, in principle, we should support impeachment. And I agree with her because I actually took pretty much the same position on impeachment. My problem, however, is that I don't trust that Democrats will not make this into a gigantic distraction. And I just know that if they focus on this, it's going to distract from the policy substance. So I... I worry about Elizabeth Warren's stance because even if this is a well-reasoned position, I don't trust that she's going to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. I just don't. But her answer was great. It was convincing. I think we do need to pursue impeachment if we want to hold powerful people to the same exact standard as everyone else. So I just hope that she's able to strike the proper balance. Um, additionally, she had a phenomenal answer for the most part about social security insurance. She gave a really historical perspective about social security. She kind of combated some of the misinformation about it going insolvent, and she explained that that's not actually true. Um, she talked about how Russia attacked our election, and the problem with her rhetoric, she said this three times, by saying Russia, quote, attacked us, that implies that you're going to take a more adversari adversarial approach to foreign policy with Russia. And even if we should do things to protect ourselves, we should increase cybersecurity. She could be supporting efforts like Tulsi Gabbard to do that, to um, secure election integrity. But when you use words like Russia attacked us, I think that's inherently hawkish. And I wish that she would kind of move away from that language. But with that being said... Besides that, it was great. She talked a little bit too much about her life's work. Like, she literally used the words, my life's work. And I don't care so much about personal stories as I do about the policy substance. Now, I do think that it's, you know, it makes sense. It's it's relatively relevant. Not to sound, that sounds a little bit redundant. But, you know, it's, it's relevant to say I care deeply about these issues because, um, you know, this is what I've been working towards, justice and equality. But I think that, it seems a little bit forced, like she's trying to go out of her way to seem personable. And Elizabeth Warren, when she just kind of stops trying, when she just embraces the inner nerdy wonk that she is, she absolutely shines. So I think that by and large, um, you know, if she just is, is herself, if she stops, you know, using the thumb point and stops taking the advice of her advisors she would do phenomenally well. She'd do better. So overall, I don't want to um, shit on her performance. I think she did a great job. I actually think that she performed better here than she did at the last town hall, and that's largely because she wasn't asked a question about Medicare for All. If she talked at length about healthcare, I would probably be inclined to be disappointed again because, as we all know, last time she moved away from Medicare for All. Um, One thing that bothered me towards the end is that she refused to really differentiate herself from President Obama, and you can see that she was clearly trying to dodge the question. Um, so Elizabeth Warren is very transparent. You can tell when she's dodging questions, um, and it doesn't come off very well, I think, to the audience. But with that being said, she had the opportunity to really discuss her policies at length, and she's a phenomenal communicator. She educates people about the history of different policies, um, she educates people about what her plans would do specifically and how it would look in practice. And I think that overall her performance was phenomenal. And it was probably the strongest of the night out of all the town halls. 
But there is the caveat that she had the most softball questions. I mean, she was challenged, but again, not to the degree that Bernie or even Kamala was. So I want to move on to Bernie Sanders. So this was nothing but gotcha questions. And I'm not going to talk too much about Bernie here because I do want to get into that separately because that's the town hall that I was, you know, I, I was most concerned with. But I'll just say this about CNN. It was evident all they wanted was gotcha questions. Gotcha after gotcha after gotcha. They wanted to pin Bernie Sanders to the wall. They wanted to corner him. And you know how biased they were when they allowed somebody, a serious person supposedly, to ask a question about how Bernie Sanders wants to implement Soviet-style policies here in the United States. And the way that this person, you know, pitched it was, well, you know, her parents flee the Soviet Union. I mean, you if you are a serious news organization, you don't let this question through unless you just want to smear Bernie Sanders. And that's exactly what they're trying to do. I mean, every single question was basically aggressive. It forced him to be combative. Um, you know, the question about Israel, for example, it was framed in the sense that Bernie Sanders was inherently wrong for being against Israel or being critical of Israel. He was asked how he'd compromise with Republicans. And I mean, all of these questions frustrate me to no end, because when are we going to start asking Republicans when they're going to compromise with Democrats? It's always incumbent seemingly on Democrats to find common ground with Republicans, but they're the ones who are on the far right. They're the ones who are becoming so extreme that they are marching off of a cliff, but yet everyone in mainstream media is only talking about the far left, and it is beyond frustrating. I'm going to get to Kamala Harris. So she overall, she's a threat. She may be Bernie Sanders' biggest threat because she is politically savvy. She knows exactly what to say. Do I believe anything that she's saying? Absolutely not. I don't believe that she'd actually fight for Medicare for All, but overall, the answer that she gave to the question about Medicare for All was brilliant. Hands down, it was brilliant. Because the question was posed to her, and it's the same question that Bernie Sanders gets. What do you say to people who currently have health insurance and they want to keep their health insurance? This is what she said. Now, I'm paraphrasing. She said, we shouldn't be duped by insurance companies and let them dupe us into defending them. We shouldn't do that. That answer right there single-handedly may have been the shining spot of the entire five, uh, five hours. That was such an amazing answer. I was actually taken aback because nobody's really talked about this in that way nobody responded in that way and that's essentially the perfect response that you want to give if somebody poses this question to you in a very biased and misleading way so that was brilliant i mean that was a phenomenal way to answer the question now i will say this she wasn't particularly strong when it comes to wanting to effectively eliminate private insurance companies she always seems to kind of stumble here and i do think that she needs to do better in this regard but i think by and large she's stuck to her guns but ideally what you want to say is look i'm not in favor of making insurance companies illegal but do i want to effectively eliminate them absolutely they can exist for supplemental coverage and she did say this but you need to stress that my goal is to make them go out of business because i want a single payer system that is so robust so good that you won't even need to think about potentially getting private insurance coverage. So overall, here's what's crazy to me. The way that Kamala Harris is talking about Medicare for All, she has surpassed Warren on this issue. Because Warren backtracks when she talks about Medicare for All. She runs away from it. When the issue of Medicare for All comes up, if you listen to Warren, she runs away from it. Kamala Harris embraces it. She runs straight towards it. So you've got to understand, the way she's talking about this is incredibly strategic and it's going to give her a huge boost i think she may be kind of losing favor among the establishment because they've moved on to support beto and then booty judge but what she's talking about here you've got to give her credit where it's due phenomenal now overall she did a good job i think she did a phenomenal job she gave a great answer on decriminalizing and really legalizing sex work she explained how we don't want to punish individuals who are in that 
industry. Um, she also gave a similar answer to reparations as Bernie Sanders. She signaled support for HR 40, um, but it's a little disappointing that she's not willing to take it further than that and actually support cash payments. But nonetheless, you know, um, the fact that they're even acknowledging HR 40, I do think that's a step in the right direction, but progress is painfully slow in this regard. But I mean, her answer was basically the same as Bernie's. Um, I think Bernie answered probably a little bit better here, but I can't be too hard on her. And overall, she was strong on LGBTQ rights. But one thing that I've got to say that kind of stood out to me, and I don't know, I don't know if this was intentional or not. She was talking about transgender rights and she said trans men. And I think what she meant to say was transgender women. Now, I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt. And I'm going to assume she wasn't intentionally misgendering transgender women. But nonetheless, you know, um, she's got to do a little bit better here. And just her history when it comes to trans rights, it does worry me. Because when she was the top cop in California, she intervened to try to block a transgender inmate's gender reassignment surgery. Moving on to Pete Buttigieg, this was by far, um, out of the four that I watched, the most boring, the most painful, and I want to show you my tweet. So going into this, I predicted that he would say something to the effect of, in 2054, when I'm the current age of the current president, and he did that. My prediction came to fruition because towards the end, at I think minute 57, he said exactly what I predicted he would say. Now, <laughs> does he say this in every single interview he does? Absolutely. So does that make me a clairvoyant? Um, no, it doesn't. I'm not a wizard. I don't have a crystal ball. But what I think that we need to acknowledge is that this is a very scripted candidate. If you watch enough interviews with him, you can memorize his talking points and the script that he uses that he sticks to very closely. Now, he's not like other politicians to where when he deviates from the script, um, he just falls off a cliff because I think he performs well when he goes off script and you can tell when he's going off script. But with that being said, um, this really is something that bugs me because politicians... I mean, we all have talking points, right? Even I have talking points. I say the same shit all the time. But to be that scripted is so frustrating to me um, because it's just typical politician bullshit. And I think we're all sick of that. We're sick of the thumb point. We're sick of all of these rehearsed lines, these focus group driven, you know, um, tested lines that irritate me. Now, I do want to give Anderson Cooper some credit here because he actually did call out Pete Buttigieg for lack of policy substance. CNN did field relatively difficult questions. There was a student from Oregon who asked him about demolishing more than a thousand homes in South Bend, Indiana within a thousand days and how that disproportionately impacted um, blacks and Latinos. Somebody asked him about why he chose to fire or demote the first African-American police chief. These are all diff difficult questions, um, and I don't think he answered them adequately, in my view. In fact, I don't really know what to even take away from his answers. I, I feel like I didn't learn anything from his answers. Because the thing about Pete Buttigieg is that he talks so long, and he explains things in such an indirect almost amorphous way that by the time he's finished answering the question, you forgot what the question was. He takes you on this long, boring journey and sitting here watching this, I can't help but think, Jesus Christ, just stop talking. Like he's got to be more concise because Jesus, it's hard to listen to him. It honestly is. He's a bright guy. He knows what he's talking about clearly, but he just takes the time to almost filibuster, it seems like, an answer in the most longest way. But you've got to be punchy. Like, you've got to be able to respond to questions in a really quick, concise, and meaningful way. Otherwise, on a debate stage against Donald Trump, you're going to get pounded into, into the pavement. You just are. Because Trump, he can answer almost any question in one or two sentences. Pete Buttigieg needs like 10 minutes to answer a simple question. He also addressed the Sanders attack. And again, he, he rubbed me the wrong way. And it's because he's just, he's bad on this topic. He says that people narrowed down their choices in 2016 
to Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. And these are all anecdotes. Polling doesn't show that, but these are anecdotal examples, so we can't disprove them. But I call bullshit. I call bullshit. Are there people who originally supported Bernie but then flipped and voted for Trump? Yes. But how large is that percentage? It's smaller than the percentage of people who voted for McCain but supported Hillary Clinton during the primary in 2008. So here's what I think he's doing. He's trying to make the valid point that people are disenfranchised and disenchanted with the political establishment. But at the same time, it seems as if he's also trying to launch a soft defense of the establishment almost because I think he knows that he's perceived to be an establishment candidate because the establishment loves him. He attended what to do about Bernie dinners with Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. So I think that he knows what he's doing. He's just savvy enough to try to hide what he was really trying to do. And that is he was trying to prime us to think about Bernie Sanders as a Trumpian candidate because we all know that Dana Milbank, he promoted this narrative in the Washington Post Bernie is the Trump of the left, and Pete Buttigieg is doing the next logical thing. He's extending that to Bernie supporters. They're also like Trump supporters, so I'm not buying what he's selling here. Um, Additionally, he says that incarcerated people should not vote. Now, what I hate about the way that CNN framed this question was they made it seem like, well, you know what, it's only going to be the murderers and the rapists, the sexual offenders, the terrorists who are going to vote. But that is such a disingenuous, superficial way to talk about this. It's a superficial way because if you are not allowing people who are incarcerated to vote, you are essentially stripping them away a crucial portion of their citizenship. And to remove citizenship and what's entailed, all the benefits entailed with that, I feel like that's a form of cruel and unusual punishment. And if you believe in democracy, then you can't support democracy with the caveat, I support universal suffrage. But either you do or you don't. This is a very black and white issue. And if you truly are for democracy, then 100% of the population should be voting. 100%. You know, in Scandinavian countries, and some at least, they literally campaign in jails and prisons. So really, I think that the judgment of how well a society is performing, I'm going to butcher a a quote here, but it's how not how well they treat the people who are best off in society, but it's how well they treat the people who are worst off in society. And the fact that this crowd of Harvard students, that they cheered that, um, it shows that they don't really care about the nuance. For the most part, this entire crowd irritated me because they asked moronic questions for the most part. Um, They asked awful questions, and it really, this caricature that I had in my mind of Harvard students being pretentious and douchey, they pretty much lived up to that expectation. So, of course, they're going to cheer, you know, um, disenfranchising felons. It reminds me, you know, this, because Kamala Harris was asked the same question, this reminds me of when Michael Dukakis was asked about the death penalty and whether or not he would support getting rid of the death penalty for someone who murdered his own family. Advocating for universal suffrage does not mean that I am pro-rapist or pro-sexual assaulter. Bernie Sanders isn't and Kamala Harris isn't because she also said this is something we should talk about. It just means that if we want to live in a just society, in a democracy, We cannot deny people the right to vote, any person the right to vote. So that irritated me. One last thing that I want to talk about is he got the question of homophobia. And as president, what would you do? How would you respond to countries? Something along those lines. I'm paraphrasing. Like Saudi Arabia, for example, who are brazenly homophobic. They literally kill people if you're gay. And he turned this into a question about America losing its credibility and why we need more credibility. But that doesn't address the crux of the question that was posed to you. And again, this speaks to Pete Buttigieg's ability to bullshit because he can take anything and turn it into this long-winded answer that makes you forget about the question that was asked. And I think this is a really effective way that he can dodge questions because it doesn't feel like a dodge because he's talking. But I mean, he's talking a lot. There's noise coming out of his mouth, but he's not saying anything meaningful. So with that being said, this is kind of my superficial overview of all of the um, candidates and their town halls. 
five hours was too long because as you can tell, I've babbled now for 30 minutes nearly. Uh, getting close there. And probably everything that I said was incoherent and it was most likely as vacuous as Pete Buttigieg. Mike is a total loser, so don't hit the subscribe button, okay? And whatever you do, folks, do not hit the notification bell either. Mike treats me so unfairly. <laughs>